Hey, all you rad dads out there. Sean, thanks for uh, taking the time to come on the Rad Dad Show. I always start the same way by asking, who are you? I'm Sean Sellers. I am a professional drummer. I play for many bands. Uh, my main ones are Good Riddance, Pulley, and Bisto Blanco. Okay. Uh, I've had full custody of my son for, wow, almost 10 years now. Okay. So I'm a father and a <laughs> so that's your main gig as a dad and then you yeah you're a you're a busy guy like I, I was kind of making notes before we chatted about just all the bands like I think a lot of people know you from Good Riddance um, but you've been in lots of different bands I mean like some of the ones that stick out to me so I know Bisto Blanco that's like kind of been in the last little while but it seems like that's really taken off that's been a big thing for you um, A Vulture Wake you played in um, you mentioned Pulley I just saw you the, the other night uh, playing in Edmonton, which was amazing. Authority Zero. You were with Real McKenzie's for a little while, right? Real who, who am I missing? Here's. What's that? The Real McKenzie's for seven years. Yeah, seven and years. Their last full-length record, I recorded drums on that also. Right. So I'm still kind of in the family. I always will be. I mean, seven years of traveling around the world with a group of people you become family yeah well you're so busy like what we were kind of talking before we got started like <laughs> looking through the schedules and trying to keep track of what's going on I'm sure it's it's crazy I mean and then throw in you know parenting and your responsibilities at home yeah so those are getting easier as he gets older yeah so um you have a son how old is your son He's 19. He's going to be 20 in October. Okay, cool. So like, take me back, I guess, like where, where, where were you in your career? I guess 20 years ago, that would have been a period of time you weren't, I don't think you were playing with Good Riddance at that time, were you? I, I uh, yeah, no, I had left Good Riddance about two years earlier, but like two years later, I got back with Good Riddance right. after he was born. So, um, I moved to LA and I was trying to find a, a band with the same drive as Good Riddance and touring and hard work, but a more rock radio friendly. Like, I, okay. I, and I still do want to go bigger. Like, I want thousands of people at my show. Like, yeah, you know, we all are bummed if there's only, I mean, it's a it can still be a great show when there's a hundred people, but it sure is way better if a thousand people showed up. Yeah. And so moved to LA and I was with Chris's mom at the time. And I, I was just feeling like I need to branch out, you know, and got in a band called kidney thieves. I did a lot of auditions. I was one away from, Seether, Puddle of Mud, Billy Idol, I was a little too young, like, Crazy. Bad Religion, Brooklyn is just a better drummer, what are you going to do? Like, He's a great drummer. You, if Brooks laughs, like, you're not getting that gig. Brooks is getting that gig. <laughs> so, you know, I, I went, but all at the same time, like, in my search, like, what I had found that you know, I was talking to Brandon, who plays in Authority Zero, yeah. of Vulture Wake, about this. Like, it's so hard as a musician to find not only a band that's willing to do the work, and you know, that's willing to eat the shit. Yeah, like you've got shit. You've got to accept that. Like to quote Anchorman, "Yeah, I'll eat the cat shit because it's gonna be worth it." to get your position you know what i mean yep. like and it's hard as you get older and, and and so but you you finding other people that are willing to do that that's not easy and what i found in the punk rock community like everyone was willing to do that yeah yeah we'll sleep yeah we'll sleep on couches 
yeah, we'll call a buddy in Kikaldi, Scotland is doing our show and our booking agent, like they're just going to reach out. Hey, we're doing a show for them, by the way, you know, like, but we're going to put seven people up in our house and we're going to do it because we're there like, all right, but that is such a hard thing to find. And then find that that has a fan base around the world. Like I was telling somebody recently, I'm like, it's hard enough to get 200 people in your hometown to your show. Yeah. Let alone in Brazil or Japan or Canada or yeah. Germany, you know what I mean? Or Kansas. Yeah. Like that's a, it's rare and unique and it's a hard thing you know when people don't make money at it they break they break they can't like yeah we put so much pressure on on you right and unbelievable amounts yeah and and well and then there's also like you didn't even mention but i I think maybe i'm just guessing here but there's also like you kind of got to be able to get along with the people you're playing with too right like to some degree i have to be on the same wavelength and that's pretty hard like even in my own experience that's pretty hard to find you you have to have a collective vision Mm -hmm. you cannot like a person or not necessarily not like them but like all right you know what i i wouldn't necessarily hang out with this person yeah but i it worked because we have a collective vision you know what I mean? And it's working and we have, you do have a chemistry. That's why it's working when you're on stage, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you need to hang out with that person. And as you get older, you know, sometimes paths change, sometimes paths actually connect closer than ever as you get older, you know, but again, it's that finding people with the collective vision and then, willing to eat shit but stick it out right you know like uh, good riddance uh, you know like we're the same four dudes yeah you know yeah drummer for a minute but it's still the it's it's decades yeah that we've been together you know we we know each other and our relationships have gotten closer actually over time like our break was a a necessary evil or a ne- just a necessity. Yeah, that made us a step back and go, wow, you know what? I I actually miss my friends. Yeah, like well, we, we we used to share a Motel Six room together. Yeah, like for months on end. You know what I mean? No one was more bummed than me when I heard Good Riddance was kind of calling it quits, and I was so happy when you guys were back afterwards like just there's yeah that chemistry there that translates through the music and and the shows and everything it's amazing uh i stay with chuck and his wife vanessa every time i'm in santa cruz yeah i've known them since they first started dating till now their kids come downstairs and give me a hug i talk to chuck almost every single day yeah that's cool but he called me from his restaurant today with a joke he was laughing and he's like dude this is the stupidest thing but it's i can't stop laughing like just shut up hang on he literally told me to shut up and was like and just fired off a joke to me but i had talked to him like two hours earlier about flights and other things you know a little bit of business but even in the there's probably like 15% business and 85% messing with each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, like high school messing with you, like full, how old are you guys? Yeah. You know, well, and it's great. And I mean, well, you've got that history, right? It's family. It's, yeah. it's for, for close. And you guys continue, like, even outside of Good Riddance, you guys have been collaborating, too. Like, you and uh, Luke played on the last 22 record, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and was- like, co-wrote some of that, I think, as well, right? <laughs> he called me 
and I was going to do the new versus the world record with Cameron Webb. This is last year. And I talked to John and I was like, yeah, I can totally do it. And, you know, they were like, when are you thinking? And I was like, well, I'm going in in three weeks to do a versus record with Cameron. I already called him. He'll set me up the week before. Totally affordable. Two weeks from now. And they freaked out. They were Crazy. like, already? Like, and I'm like, no offense, but like, you're playing my wheelhouse. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it, 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 you're not throwing odd time. This isn't math rock. This yeah. isn't like, this is punk rock. And like, I don't need much time. I, I can write based on what I hear. And then I'm going to go in with Cameron and be prepared, but it'll be irrelevant because Cameron's going to work with me. And like, Ooh, you know, I think you do something cooler. But then in, in that situation, John wanted other, you know, he no, I'll play it kind of like I programmed. Okay, even easier. Yeah. Like I'll do what you wanted. What you, okay. Like I don't need two, three, six months. Like, dude, yeah. you sent me 12 songs. I'm gonna go record them. Fuck it. I'll do it tomorrow. Like, and it'll take me two, three days. Like, yeah. I'll learn them. I'll and I I love technology because even with filming you know like i write in my head i can listen to something over and over and have a couple beers and yeah you know have, have a smoke and all of a sudden i'm like i start freaking out and i'll i'll write things and then i'll sing them into my phone yeah and, and you know and then like the next day i can go get on the kit and was like I'll play the demo back and I'm like, wait, wait, wait what was that? I'm like, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, dude, what were you thinking last night? But then I try <laughs> to execute it and I'm like, oh, yeah, that is rad. But there's other times too that just in the moment, and I'm glad of the technology of filming, yeah. I'll write things that I'm like, I have to go back and go wait glitching. oh yeah Sorry. yeah you were kind of glitching on me too i was waiting for you to catch up but yeah you're back you're back well no that yeah. i mean that's amazing like when i like with the 22 record i mean it's great turned out great but it's so funny like you really have um like i i, I think this is a pretty uncommon thing at least to my ear that a drummer like is totally recognizable by their style and you are one of those players like there's a few that are like it one's behind me oh other arm bill stevenson here is one you can tell it's him on a record you're the same way it's like i can i can tell that's sean sellers and it just it came out awesome on that record um but i i want to before we kind of like keep going down that path i want to take you back a little bit to that time so you were saying you'd move to la you're kind of trying to you know yeah. find something that's going to allow you to to take things to the next level and then you have a child. So how does that play into yeah. that whole journey? Like, tell me about that time. It, you know, I was I moved down there. I was working for a temp agency. I, I took about eight months off. Um, I got married. It's like, okay, let me kind of go here. here. I'll take a little time but i make a living playing drums mm -hmm. like this temp job sucks you know and and then probably about eight months at most i get a call from the ataris hey we need you to fill in and it's like look dude i just made as much money that i would make in a month in a week yeah like uh, you know, this is stupid and then we I also started doing like extra work in Hollywood and that was cool, but it took, you know, it's 12 hour days and I want to play. Like but when you say, when you say extra work, work then you're, you're like, talking like you're, as an extra and yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can see me in the salt and sea. Okay. With Val, uh, 
two episodes when Sex in the City goes to LA, yeah, like the original series. Yeah, you can see me being by the pool, and then my ab my from like here down floating by them in the pool. Oh, crazy! And, I'll I'll have to pull a clip of that and put it up on our account. And then I was dressed up like a devil as a bartender in hell on a Drew Carey show. Oh, crazy! Yeah, awesome. That was pretty fun. I totally could have been in the union too, but so when I was doing the Salt and Sea, Jordan from Strung Out, out broke his ankle riding his motorcycle a week before they go on tour. So they call me and I'm like, absolutely. However, don't have me quit this two week movie that I'm going to be on to go learn your songs that are going to be a struggle for me to play. Cause I totally don't play double bass. I mean, I yeah. can now, but that's not my forte. And like some of the fills, I have no idea what the fuck he's doing. So yeah. I got a lot of work to do but i don't need to quit a job go learn a set only to go oh i'm gonna do it with my left foot which is totally what happened yeah and i was like oh, dude that's beyond not cool <laughs> yeah but that also scared me as to of like dude you were you pulled off a strung out set in a week with one with playing it on a single pedal. Yeah, crazy. And the band Insane. was. So I'm like, you know what? Cool. And so I just kept fighting forward and doing, uh, that's when I was really doing auditions and, yeah. you know, raising Chris. And then I started doing stagehand work. Okay. Because that allowed time, you know, I could work, make a good amount of money, but still play if a tour came up. Hey, dude, I'll be back in a month. Yeah. Does you know what I mean? Like, okay, hey, killer. So how did you how did you kind of balance that, you know, those family responsibilities? You're raising a kid while you're trying to sort of grind it out and and find that path forward. What what was that sort of balance like? Um it was a hard balance for sure. Um there was about four years when his mom and I split up. Okay. Um, I was a touring musician. Um, her, her junkie issues. Okay. Were irrelevant. If you go to court in Arizona, I'm going to lose. I could have spent 50, fifty thousand dollars i talked to a person with the same shit and i'm like you know what i'm gonna go a different route i'm gonna actually rise above yeah because i'm not the junkie i'm not the, but hang on you know i i went through some shit but i moved to canada actually oh really yeah i moved to quebec i moved to sherbrooke okay Living with the woman there. Uh, then I started doing construction. Uh, my friend Padge, who was a promoter in, in Montreal, who did Snow Jam. Oh, yeah. And Curtis, yeah. who played you. Curtis, um, my friend Chris Snellgrove is friends with Curtis, and they got me doing construction. So I was working. Padge would let me do stagehand work up there. And I was paying bills in Canada paying some child support i was calling my kid when i was home i was still in the mckenzie's so whenever i wasn't on tour every time i would tour i'd go home and see him yep. and i'd go back to camp but i had to be that far away for safety purposes even though yeah. it was awful to be away from him for those four years yeah but i always i was like dude it's four years by the time you're 10 gonna be with me dude. yeah and and that plan sounds like that plan worked out i'm like by 2013 it's on and then by like whatever fifth grade i mean his whole fifth grade year he was i was in santa barbara finally 
um, he was with me. I would do like eight hour, 16 hour drives to get him drive back to Santa Barbara, yeah. spend three days and then drive back. I mean, but, and then he finished fifth grade and I'm just no cord. I didn't need to, I had already proven my, like I knew, I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And I saw the other of the other individual and it's like well, this is a no-brainer but it must be tough too yeah so it must must be tough to like you talked about taking the high road like it must be tough to kind of maintain that focus on this is where i want to get and i just have to like i know those situations can be tough it's come up on the show before you know friends who've been through separations it sounded like this was you know there was a lot going on um and a lot to it oh yeah you know but staying focused on that goal of like kind of, you know, having full custody, um, you know, maintaining that relationship. It's, it's so hard for people. Yeah. The, the high road has an unbelievable amount of power in it, mm -hmm. but it's hard to to almost to embrace the power in the high road because it's so hard yeah to take the high but you know i i've been in the unfortunate situation a few times and chris has watched me and he's learned from this too and i've been a advocate about this to friends who are going through bad times and relationships or breaking up and they mm -hmm. come to me and i'm okay but the high road is so, so empowering because the moment you're able to take it and, and you can recognize like, okay, you know what, what of it was me. But then as you're, as you're taking in that high road, you can look kind of at the lower road and be like, Oh shit. I totally see what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to, you're, you're, desperately trying to get me to take the lower road below the road that you're on yeah because the moment i did that there's so much ammunition yeah and and if you just suck it up take the high road and then walk away and and think about it you know and there's so much to learn from it but there's again there's so much empowerment from the high road yeah and there's actually rewards at the end of it which i've seen every single time that i've taken it yeah that's so powerful to be able to to experience that but then to to be able to share that with other people too right um be able to say like i've done it you can do it too done it multiple times and every time i do it the reward at the end of the road Cause you only have to take it for so long. And then eventually like the road just ends with whatever situation it ends. Eventually yeah. it just ends. And then you're back your own path. But what you don't even realize is that that other path has taken your path to a little bit of a better zone. Yeah. But you've got a reward at the end. My biggest one was, was full custody of Chris with, just, hey, by the way, I'm coming to pick him up June 1st when he's done with his last day of school. Yeah. So have whatever you send with him packed and uh, he'll probably see you at Christmas. Yeah. Must have felt Unless so, you want to drive so good. To it was epic. And and because so no matter what I would. Oh, sorry right. to, to cut you off. I was just saying, so since that point, so you, you get to have been together in the same same city same place yeah. yeah 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 his mom lived about eight hours away even when i lived in canada i mean i was seeing him almost every month there was only yeah. a couple periods that went like three months without seeing him but i called him every day yeah and this was in the time of cell phones but not when they worked in europe right you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You had to go get the different SIM card or whatever. And it just, yeah, it was a, totally impossible. Calling from the club, but yeah. I called him. Every 
Yeah. I homework with him when I wasn't on tour. I would do his homework with him over the phone every day. Every day. I'd wake him up for school every day. Yeah. On point. In Quebec, so it's three hours ahead, no problem. Chomping, waiting to wake him up, just staring, waiting, waiting, yeah. waiting. Cool. So Waking cool. My kid up. So cool so to hear all- you talk about that, that like dedication to that, you know, that purpose to your son. And then also to that goal of kind of, you know, reuniting, I guess. So, um, you know, we, <laughs> this is the rad dad show. So I have to ask, like, do you consider yourself a rad dad? Ew. Yeah. So what does that mean to you? Uh, to me, it means. Knowing how to, to let go. Knowing how to be a dis be a disciplinary figure, knowing how to, to be a sympathizer, knowing how to be everything. And as a single dad, Mm -hmm. you know, you got to take on many hats and to be a rad dad, truly rad dad, you're going to have worry, but you're going to knowing you did it right. When you can look at your kid and go, (laughs) <laughs> yeah all right yeah, like i can't even i like i want to get mad at you right now but i totally can't get mad at you because you're killing it right now yeah so there's you that know, and, that pride is part of it too yeah and and but pride in knowing that you had the, the balls to be an asshole sometimes mm-hmm. to make you hate you not because you want them to hate you, but because, sorry, you fucked up, and now you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. And you know what? You fucked up so bad, the neighborhood can hear me yelling at you. Yeah. But now you're also frightened to death of me yelling at you like this again, that you're not going to fuck up like that again. <laughs> it's a hard thing to do as a parent, though, right? And it's brutal. Yeah. I've only had to spank him a couple times. I got to tell you, now I fully understand that it is going to be harder for me than you. Yeah. And when we're kids, bullshit, you're an asshole. I hate you. Yeah. And actually, is the paper in the other room crying? Yeah. Because you just had to wake his ass for totally blowing it. And it sucks, but it needs to be done so that they recognize, so that we recognize cause and effect you know yeah you can't get away with everything yeah there's not how it works yeah you talked about that like discipline thing and that's such a hard thing for for parents right there's there's kind of like it's tough to recognize those times when maybe what they need is support maybe what they need is some discipline like that's kind of the art of it right that's what makes it tough absolutely Discipline and responsibility. Mm-hmm. That as as a single father, my son, he beat cancer, graduated high school, got his license at 18, took over his car insurance, and yeah. when I he transferred the car into his name, started doing Uber Eats, working at the steakhouse. But doing Uber Eats, I gave him three grand, but he needed seven more to be a partner in a saltwater fish tank store in Goleta. Yeah. And now he's a business. And he works at his own business that only makes enough money to keep the shop running. He's only 19. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't go to college. And I you know, get mad when people are like, oh, it's college is like the college of life. He owns <laughs> a business in Santa Barbara California at 19. I don't yeah. know. What's he going to learn there that he's already not learning owning the business, but like he's now 10 years ahead of every college kid. Yeah. There's, there's lots of different paths in life, man. There's, there's uh, so much pressure to like, you know, follow some artificial 
path in life. And that works for lots of people. Um, <laughs> even myself, like I, you know, after high school, I sort of went straight to university. I kind of, I didn't know there was anything else I could have done, but in some ways I do have some regrets about that too. And so I think you, you need to follow what path is in front of you. There's no right answer. Mm -mm. There isn't, but I think if you, first of all, the only way you fail is you give up. Yeah. That you've guaranteed to fail. Like, I will not give up. I was put on this earth to be a drummer. I'm, mm -hmm. if you've ever you've seen me play, yeah. it's pretty obvious. 145 pound dude was put on this earth to be a dad and a fucking drummer. Yeah. Like, that's who I am. And I'm smiling and I, it's always all good. But I, and there are times when I, but, I had a full scholarship to run cross country and go to University of Laverne, a private college that doesn't give scholarships that they were going to give me one. I was going to be team captain. My parents had split. I had nobody guiding me, but I was in a band with college graduates from UCSB called Downcast. Mm -hmm. And we were fucking going to Europe in September. Eight months later, I met Lagwagon. Lagwagon helped get me in good riddance. The original Lagwagon was my best friend who taught me how to play punk rock drumming. Yeah. And I went to Europe at 18. I was completely, when I say on my own, like, I mean, on my own, like if I didn't have food or rent, like it sucked to be me. Like nobody was covering that. I couldn't make a phone call to mom and dad. Yeah. You know, like, hey, Ralph's across the street throws away their day old in the dumpster. Day old bread, rad. I'm 18. Like, yeah. I, I gotta get, I gotta eat. And there's nobody there. Then I meet Lagwagon and I'm so addicted to drumming and skateboarding. And then I meet Derek and he's really inspiring me and I'm touring. I've already toured and I got the bug. Like I went to Europe and didn't make any money, lost weight, barely ate food. 1992 squat tour. There ain't no money there. Yeah. And I couldn't wait to do it. All I could think about was when do we leave again? Yeah. I fed you know what I mean? Like, whatever, let's just go, let's go. Couldn't believe it. I became a, a better drummer from that tour. And then I met Derek and then, holy crap, there's this punk band in Santa Barbara in 1993 and 1994. And they're making money. They're getting paid. Yeah. They all have jobs. But then when they went on tour, they would come home with money. And I'm like, dude, you're going to, I, I can't wait to go back to Europe. And I was in a new wave style ska band called Sparker in Santa Barbara. Okay. That actually inspired the Mad Caddies to be a band. Crazy. You know, both Chuck, Keith, and, and uh, uh, the, they'll all tell you, like, the original dudes will tell you it was this band Sparker. We were in high school and I was in that band. Crazy. I tried to get assigned to Fat yep. through Derek, through Lagwagon. Didn't happen, but Lagwagon put us on a show in Sacramento that happened to be Sparker opening, then AFI, who only had a seven inch out, and then Good Riddance, right when Forgotten Country came out, yep. and Lagwagon. I'll never forget it. Before the show even started, Joey comes out and he goes, hey, dude, you know what? Good riddance needs a drummer. I was like, what? <laughs> and I told it, it just so happened that I kind of, through our mutual friend, Caton, Chuck and I knew each other. Yeah. They went out to dinner. They had their merch guy watch and he was like, that wasn't fast doing what you guys doing it was horrible, but I kind of punished them all summer. I had a cassette tape with Tony Palermo 
from 10 foot pole papa roach yeah playing drums on a summer tour with them like he was filling in so i had his version which is next level and i met tony through derek and lag wagon so i have derek teaching me how to play these tony parts yeah crazy I, they I did didn't know whole, that they did the whole summer dude and i showed up i even knew the new songs yeah but i knew them the way tony had been playing them yeah that's awesome yeah that's awesome i i had no idea i never really knew that story about how you um connected with good riddance that's so crazy um and i didn't i sort of didn't know that derek was a bit of a mentor for you in that regard too yeah Sounds like he had that effect on a lot of people. Yeah. I was extremely fortunate to uh, the, my only regret is that I don't have the four track cassette tapes of him and I drumming together. Well, let's be on him. Cause I would just go push record and record him play for like an hour with no music, no nothing, just him and I jamming. And then he would leave and I would go back and listen to him. And I would, just, I'm like, I don't even know what's going on here. Like, this is so gnarly. Yeah. But I would study him. Like, I, and then a good friend of mine who mentored Derek, um, this guy, Jonathan Gorman, who owns a company called iCreative. Yeah. Um, and he ended up going to Berkeley School. He went to Berkeley School of Music for drumming. And and Jonathan mentored both Derek and I. Crazy. And those two guys, like, they made drums sing. They made drums sound like something I'd never heard before. And I wanted to make the way I played drums sound like the way they played drums because, mm -hmm. wow, like, the way you hit the symbols and every everything is uh, i want to do that you know well i think that like goes and back I to what i was going, saying you start going up yeah sorry we we um we're breaking up there a little bit i think it goes back to like what we were talking about before about having that sort of signature sound and that's where that all sort of came from yeah right so what like i'm curious what is um what is your son think about what you do what does your son think about your career i have a better answer for that question oh sure yeah <laughs> hey chris yeah hey chris hey i'm brett yeah brett. good to meet you i was asking your dad what what do you think about his uh his career that we, we're uh we're on the rad dad's show right now so is your dad a rad dad i think so it's pretty rad indeed uh, no, his career is a great career. I mean, you know, great experiences all around. Ever growing, growing up around it, going on tour. I mean, it was a uh, an adventure to say the least. Yeah. What's your favorite of his bands he's in? Um, probably Good Riddance. Yeah. Me too. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's rad. Well, it's yeah, it's cool to to meet you and to see you, and I'm glad to hear you're doing doing well i know you you know you've been through some stuff medically uh over the last little while and as a family i know that's hard to go through too so yeah glad to see you're doing well i'm doing super good now don't have to worry about anything everything you know, all that love. Business. yeah you know what it's kind of interesting i um went through a cancer diagnosis when i was young too i was 21 at the time it's a hard thing to go through as a young guy so yeah take take care of yourself like i i was you know lucky i sort of got through it and um y you know it's I, it totally cured um but it was hard, hard even afterwards so take care of yourself don't forget that because i kind of wish someone had told me that sometimes just processing it later so scott from oh. bull definitely gotta take care of myself so yeah for sure hey, hey, good, good meeting you so you know scott from Poli went through the same cancer chris had when he was 21 really white Sox. so actually like you know i had 
a good written of five shows, a good riddance booked in January. I had a Bisto run. I had a few things that I I had to do. I have to we've got to pay our bills, you know. And he got hit in December and I'm like, okay, scheduling things. And Scott ended up coming up in January and watching Chris. And like really connecting with them and kind of mentoring him a little bit through awesome. it. And then he ended up coming up a week and staying with Chris the second time, which ended in the past of the tour got cut short. Right. So, you know, Scott just stayed. Um, but they had a super tight connection and, and, you know, Scott, when he sees him, you know, and Scott tells him, he was like, dude, I've got health issues that are a direct result of the chemo mm -hmm. at 55, you know, like you can't, like, I know you ignore your dad sometimes, but you know, he gets on a we ball to you. And then yeah. Chris, but you know, he treats his plants and his fish and, coral so he he gets it and when i'm home we run a good program yeah that's good yeah i think like it, it is something like you know you, you, yeah you might have sort of like things go on kind of medically afterwards i i just i think um for myself there was like a lot of like mental stuff i was dealing with afterwards like you just because you get in that i'm sure it was the same for you sean like oh my god my kid has cancer like like and you just kind of almost like get into this survival mode. Um, like I remember my parents talking about that uh, with me, like, um, okay, we just got to get through this. And you almost like, don't even breathe. You don't think you just like, just go through it and you just do what you have to do. Um, so there's kind of that, like Definitely. come down after, right? No, I, I'm affected by it more now than I was then. Mm -hmm. Like, like that's where my you know i went to military school when i was younger like that's where my discipline like you don't have cancer we're beating that shit yeah and, yeah you know, my girl she's a healer and she was making herbs for him and got us on we were on we went vegan juicing doing all these natural things like he gained weight during chemo yeah like we I ran it so hard that he gained weight and three months into cancer, he was cancer free. Yeah. And, you know, we ran the treatments through, but just running a program and, and always PMA all yeah. day. Yeah. That does a lot. Always keep. I told him, I'm like, this is just a brief moment in time. Mm -hmm. And a step I'm like, we're getting through this. It's going to take less than a year. And, and it, you know, maybe a year, but in the grand scheme, it doesn't matter, dude. We're, we're, we're killing this. Yeah. You're fine. Yeah. yeah. I was watching, um, like, you know, keeping track of your, your posts on Instagram. You're kind of, you know, sharing the odd update here and there. Round one, a chemo round two. I think, you know, it's like three or four or five, maybe five rounds or something. Um, and I was watching and when I saw that, that message in the end, you know, it was like, got the, the scan back and it's cancer free. It's like, man, oh, it's just amazing to, to hear that. Like, I just can't imagine how tough that, that would be not only for your son, but for you as well, just to go through that. Yeah, it was, and then we were going through it when lockdown happened. So. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which is crazy. Like I saw, I saw some of your your uh, posts that you weren't allowed to sort of be there for the treatments and stuff. And like, that's just such a, such a shame. and so hard to, to deal with when you can't just be there to, to support, you know, your son. That was pretty gnarly, but thankfully we live in Santa Barbara. So when we were home, we live in a tiny little beach town. Like yeah. you couldn't really tell, you know what I mean? Like, no, just some shops aren't open and, like no everyone's wearing a mask cool that keeps us safe yeah you know it's pretty funny we were still just on the beach every day and 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just sort of get through it. It's just like what we were talking about, right? You just sort of get through it. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm super stoked. Um, yeah. And I appreciate you kind of talking about it and sharing that story and um, yeah, it's like every parent's worst nightmare to hear that. Right. So, um, but you maintain that PMA and you guys got through it. And yeah. Just really excited for you guys. That's awesome. Um, what's, what's next for you, Sean? Like we were, Part of why we're talking is you're going to be in Edmonton, so Rad Dad's territory for um, the Sea Change Super Friendly Fest. Super excited! I'm going to be there. Well, a bunch of us from Rad Dads are going to be there. Um, you're playing Calgary before that, Winnipeg before Calgary, and then I think you're headed to Red Deer Red. after after yeah. Edmonton. So a little quick stint in Western Canada. So um, what what else is is happening? And and then I literally go home for two and a half days and then fly to montreal with pulley yeah and we play the music for cancer fest right and then that puts me on for maybe again another two and a half weeks and then good riddance has a show in portland with anti-flag and bad cop bad cop oh right night before that we're playing little warm-up show in Tacoma Washington and that's the beginning of October and at the end of October Bisto Blanco is doing the Kiss Cruise oh man that's awesome super awesome and then two days when I get home from that I play Punk in the Park with both Pulley and Good Riddance and, <laughs> that's and, crazy so are you playing on the same day or is yeah is that one day yeah oh man my good friend so i'm endorsed by hendrix drums which is owned by rhino rhino is, yep yeah from he works for descendants and he's a huge he's my brother and uh, literally is taking care of me forever he's drum tech on the last he did he tech for the 22 record for me the pulley record i called him and i was like hey dude like i need your help and he was like what i'm like i'm doing pulley good riddance on punk in the park like i i need you to like cool i just booked my ticket and um yeah so i got i got my hotel to marriott you want me to get you a room there too and i was like whoa yeah, what? so i guess we're coming yeah he was like totally. i'm there yes so he's yeah. going to help navigate me and, and kind of, cause I'm going to need some, cause I think we're on two different stages. So, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Call in the pros. Right. So, yeah. and I'm, but I'm also fully endorsed by that company. So I'm a Hendrix artist and it does yeah. kind of benefit him Hendrix drums and they're there, you know, Yeah. but it, it'll, yeah, it's going to be good. And he, I love him to pieces. He came yeah. out for the pulley record. And... Seems like everybody yeah. loves loves Jeff. He's uh yeah, pretty pretty well respected. And yeah, he's got a good thing going with uh Hendrix drums and he like he does sleeved washers too, right? And then the drum keys. Uh there was a good riddance Sean Sellers drum key I saw. So uh yeah, that's pretty cool. He's rad. He he's he's my brother. Well, shout out to Rhino. Yeah. Might might catch a glimpse of, of him this weekend. Uh, Descendants are in Edmonton this weekend for Punk and Drublek. Yeah, I'm missing him by a week, which is typical. Yeah, I'll I'll say hi for you if I manage to catch his ear for a second. He's usually pretty busy at shows, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to bother him. Yeah, definitely. And how about how about recordings? Any any recording coming up with anybody? You got tons of shows happening. Um, yeah. Anything coming yeah, down the no, pipe? I I don't have any recordings coming up. So if you know anybody that wants to <laughs> hire sellers to play drums, okay, I'll like, put the word out. Um, little Joe from Lagwagon. Uh, we have a buddy up north that I recorded some songs for that I might go record with again whether they turn joe will play bass probably yep. when i record joe up going you know what? I'll, I'll play bass yeah so whether they turn it in anything i don't know but 
uh, you know, I love recording. The problem is I don't have my own studio. So then I have to, and Cameron Webb will always be like, I one phone call and he was like, okay, yeah, it, it'll come down. He'll make it affordable. Yeah. But it's like, I, it's now you're me and Cameron because I don't have my own studio. Like somebody's got to record this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Where, so if people want to follow what you're doing, cause you're busy, like, I don't know how we keep, I don't know how you keep track of it, let alone, how are we going to follow everything that's going on? Where can people find you online? Uh, Sean, at Sean Sellers drummer on Instagram. Okay. Um, I actually am on Facebook, but I deleted all my Facebook apps. So it's really just Instagram. Okay. Um, DM me there. I check even the hidden requests which are usually garbage, but yep. I do them because sometimes there is somebody that, oh, cool, I did need to talk to you. Yeah. So I I do actually check those. Um, that's the easiest way. Okay, sweet. So people and can, uh, can find you online at Instagram and follow what you're doing. I'm super stoked. We're going to see you guys um, it's been a while for me. I'm trying to think the last time I saw Good Riddance. I don't know. Would it have been like 2017? No, it wouldn't even been 2017. I think it was before that. It might have been 2015 or something in, in Edmonton. The Vulture Wake. Oh, maybe that's, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and maybe, I don't know. I might've seen you actually at Punk Rock Bowling or something in between then. I can't remember. But anyway, I'm stoked to see you guys. Um yeah, I hope uh, hope the tour goes great for you. I want to ask you: Do you have any um, advice for dads out there? Um, you know, maybe maybe dads to be. Dads to be. Embrace the time bef before they're a preteen. <laughs> but don't get so wrapped up in that time that you can't let them let let that time go and let them grow up yeah because they grow up so you we talked all... about you talked about letting go i guess geez i was trying to wrap it up here but now i have a question for you, you talked about letting go is that what you meant like kind of letting it happen a little bit mm -hmm. yeah so when you think about like our parents, they didn't have cell phones and Life360 and monitoring. Yeah. It was be home when the streetlights come home. And I hope that nothing happens to you for the next eight hours that I have no idea where you are and what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's cr a crazy thought, actually. And we're so, I, I know I, I can be in Europe and I'm like, where's Chris? Yeah. Oh, cool. He at his shop or oh he's at the steakhouse oh look he's obviously uber eating oh he's at home oh he's hanging with his bros at the beach like that luxury should be enough yeah and what i found for the most part not everybody um chuck and vanessa i think are very similar to myself and again and it's not easy you know, it's very hard to let go. But for myself as a single parent, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. We were living in a guest house. I knew that he could pound on the wall and my friend would be running out. And I knew my neighbor was literally looking down with binoculars, making sure my kid was okay when he was 15, 16. I'll be back in five days. You got shitloads of food. The neighbor or Mike is getting you to school they'll get you or you can walk, but you need to do home. Like you got to not blow it. When I was 15, I mean, I was going to sketchy. I was going to like Venice in the eighties and skating. Yeah. And, and you know what I mean? Like the amount of sketchiness that I was doing, not other than just like, wow, I was like traveling 
kind of sketchy neighborhoods to go skateboard. Like, but they just didn't know. Right. Ignorance is bliss. And that's, I mean, some of those things, that's like where you, you grow. I, there's been lots of people who come on the show and talk about that too. Like those times, like, you know, your kid climbs a tree and like your, your tendency is like, oh, I want to just like make sure they don't fall. But sometimes the falling is what, you know, what, what they learn from. And so, yeah, I, I think that's good advice. Yeah. And when they fall, you got to, you, you can't you can't pick them back up. You need to let themselves pick themselves back up, but support them yeah. in picking themselves back up. I will be here with you yeah. while you go through this, but you have to go through this. Yeah. Oh, you got, you got busted for weed. Okay. I'll go through this with you, but this is what you want to do. Then the game has changed. I cannot control what you do outside when I'm not there because you're gone most of the time. Oh, shit. Now you got busted. You got to go to a class. I got to go to a class. Okay. Let's deal with this differently. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, there comes to a point where you have to accept it doesn't matter what you do actually overdoing it works against you yeah working with the situation benefits you because then what happens you get closer and you start to realize like the situation i'm kind of like that happened with chris and i you know this is before cancer and then when he went through cancer he let him smoke as much weed as he wanted fire up johnny you yeah know, like whatever <laughs> will help you eat food yeah but we had to go to a class and like i did it but he was already old enough but I, to where i'm like okay i'm now here with you and the class was a joke to both of us it was how well do you know your kid and i checked all the boxes and the woman was like wait are you serious about all of these answers? And I'm like, yeah, that kid's my best friend. And now that we're here, there's really like, it's a full open relationship now. Yeah. You know? And she was like, whoa. And I'm like, yeah, we don't need to be here, but I have to be here. So let's do this. Yeah. You know? And it's, but I learned so much that I uh, hanging out with friends of mine you know I pointed out to their like their kid came home from something and was hanging out and they went upstairs I said like, your kids totally smoking weed and they went no they're not and I went yeah they are how do you know and I was like well I've already been through this yeah. I do but I didn't want to believe my kid did but then when it got the obvious and then now we have an open relationship and i'm like oh shit i'm not blind to what's right in front of me yeah your kids smoke and then like literally a year later they were like so i gotta tell you something and i was like what's up they were like so you were the first one to tell us that and you were totally right and i yeah. was like <laughs> no and it's okay you know like honestly i, I would rather kids smoke weed and drink yeah you know, like drinking vodka and, and like things that are like truly harmful and you make really bad decisions on alcohol mm -hmm. weed you eat a bunch of food and giggle and watch movies and you make far less bad decisions i mean maybe on food you make bad decisions but yeah. that's like kind of the it in high school yeah you know and even that being said, like, we can't forget as parents, like, dude, what, did you, what were you doing? And we had more freedom because we had no cell phones. Right. So, like, to, to be ignorant to think your kids aren't going to do the same thing is stupid. Yeah. It's stupid. 
Well, and, it se- yeah, it seems like you guys have an awesome relationship and there's that trust there, right? And that's like what you're really trying to get with your your kids is how can I, like, I don't need to be their best friend necessarily. You you might end up as they get older, but but how do you get that trust to where when shit goes down, they're going to come to you. Um, yeah. And that's that's really what you want, right? Have to build that. Yeah. Because, I mean, even in any relationship, you know, yeah. trust, there's nothing. Yeah. But with your kids, and especially, you know, in this day and age, you got to have the hard talks, but you yeah. got to build the trust. And as, you know, the teenage years, you got to bite the bullet and, and, you know, be honest with who you are and be like, you know what, dude, I know you're probably going to do this or you might do that. You know what? I'd rather you let me know or come to me and hang out here then. You guys hang out here. Yeah. Because then I know you're, I'm not advocating that, but what I'm advocating is trust and honesty, communication. And then we can discuss what's happening yeah. we can keep regulated we can go hey things are getting not you know like are you noticing this because i'm noticing this maybe yeah. not with you but the other pe- people and then they start going oh my gosh you're totally right and i'm like yeah just saying watch yourself yeah because you have to say good because i was on my own at 18 and kids go away to college at 18 so what you think like well i hope i did right like dude you have no idea what they're doing when we're not there yeah but with trust and honesty you actually might know what's going on there and sometimes knowing sucks but it's so much better than not knowing yeah because then guide them you can give them her advice you can then you can communicate like a friend and a parent and advise him hey dude this is what i did these are the mistakes that came along with me making this decision oh don't get me wrong had a super good time mm-hmm. however this is what happened afterwards and that's where it landed me and this is what happened you know so i'm just i just don't want to see you do that so you can actually openly tell stories and give advice and make them laugh and connect and be like uh, hey i'm gonna hang out i know i'm hanging at home tonight you know which happens all the time with this yeah. one he's here like his day off today we're just it's him and i so i'm yeah. gonna come in <laughs> yeah i love that um well i think that's a great great place to wrap it it's been awesome talking with you man getting to kind of hear a bit of your your story um yeah sharing some really personal stuff so i do, do really appreciate that and um you know like i said i'm so glad to see like it's really neat to see the relationship you have with your your son with chris and um yeah i appreciate you sharing that with us here i'm sure people are going to love hearing about it and um stoked to see you in a couple of weeks in yeah. uh in, well, not in Edmonton, in Beaumont, I guess, because I think that's I think that's where the show is, right? So, at the hotel, and John F. Kennedy was like, "That's the venue," and I was like, "Cool, I'll see it in two weeks." Yeah, <laughs> I'll be yes, back. yeah, totally can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah, it's great, great lineup, and super stoked to see you guys. So, um, can't wait. So yeah. many friends. Well, we'll uh, yeah, we'll touch base afterwards. I'll I'll bring you a shirt and. Uh, you know, yeah, we'll hook up there. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate your time today. Thank you.